Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 193 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at trucks and how to electrify logistics. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to say, if you're new here, welcome. On this podcast, we talk about renewables, electric vehicles, things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners, and there's almost 200 episodes in the back catalogue covering topics such as charging, buying a new or used EV, electric planes, electric boats, personal electric vehicles such as e-bikes, e-scooters and one wheels. We've got discussions with the National Grid, the AA, the heads of the main charge point operators, key players in the motoring world such as Quentin Wilson. There's also episodes talking about EV insurance, your first day with an EV, running your car in cold weather, charger rage, and we've got reviews of pretty much all the electric cars on sale from people who own and have run them for the last six months. So check out the back catalogue. I'm sure you'll find something of interest. Our main topic of discussion today is trucks and fleets. More specifically, I'm talking logistics and electrifying that aspect of transportation. There is a saying which goes something along the lines of everything you can see, touch or eat has been on the back of a truck at some point. Trucks or lorries, as we call them in the UK, are an integral part of the logistics network. They transport everything from live cattle and wind turbine blades to containers full of Chinese tap that's come across on a ship from the Far East. And it's a huge business, but we'll get to that in a short while. Back in the mists of time, I did some work at the headquarters of a major shipping company which handled some of these shipping containers. And it's a pretty much 24-hour operation getting these containers off trucks and onto the ship or off the ship and onto trucks. And depending on the cargo and the destination, there's a whole range of trucks that can be used for this. 10 ton trucks, 20 ton trucks, 40 ton articulated lorries. Some are panel sided, some are open sided, some are refrigerated. And the one thing they all have in common at the moment is that they generally all run on diesel. Now, diesel has a number of advantages. It's easily obtainable, it's reasonably efficient in terms of the distance a lorry can go on a gallon of diesel, and you can find diesel at pretty much every petrol station around the country. As a result, there's a huge ecosystem that's grown up around diesel, diesel refuelling, and the whole transportation or logistics industry in general. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at this aspect of transportation and considering some of the challenges and solutions to getting dirty diesel off our roads and replacing it with something that's more eco-friendly and much lower pollution. We're going to be looking at the scale of the issue and the potential solutions that are out there. We'll also look at the challenges around implementing these solutions and where we are along the timeline of implementation. Now, this podcast has done over 190 episodes so far, and during those 190 episodes, we've covered many, many aspects of the electric vehicle revolution. We've looked at myths and legends, we've looked at specific electric cars, we've spoken to thought leaders, CPO executives, charger manufacturers, breakdown service operators. We've looked at running electric vans, electric planes, electric boats. Hell, we even did an episode on electric flying cars. Now, someone listening to these episodes could come away with the feeling that, for the most part, it's fairly quick and easy to electrify something. To create an electrified version of a car, such as the Jaguar I-Pace, the e-Nero, a VW ID model, or a Nissan Leaf, you throw up some charges, and that's pretty much the bulk of the work done. Now, sure, there's going to be teething troubles when it comes to things such as the right number of charges in the right place, costs of vehicles, getting the public to understand that this isn't a passing fad that will be replaced with something else in a few years, all that sort of stuff. And that's a hearts and minds thing, which will sort itself out in the end. After all, it's your car, your drive, your charger, your money, you work with a solution that fits the best for you and look to the government to incentivize what needs to be done at a national scale. But when you move the focus from personal transportation, such as cars, bikes and scooters, and refocus it to cargo transportation, the issues change dramatically. Whereas the earlier issue with personal transport was how much do I pay to get an EV and a charger, 
when it comes to cargo and logistics, the questions are a lot different. Businesses are obviously driven by costs, but they're also driven by lots of other factors that private car owners don't really need to take care of or be concerned about. We spoke with Lorna McAteer, head of fleet at National Grid last season. In that discussion, she talked about some of the issues she has to deal with when it comes to running a fleet of vans, cars and 4x4s, and whether it was just a case of throwing a few charges in at a depot. I would love for it to be that accurate and that easy. I think if it was, then my life would, my job would be done. It's never that simple, is it, Gary? It's a real challenge when you come there. And I think a lot of that, if we put some context behind commercial vehicles, they've always been the poor relationship in any company. So when I was at Royal Mail with the largest commercial fleet in the UK, it was still not priority compared to the actual post is delivering out there. So vehicles are always down the pecking order in terms of priority. Now, imagine you were running a fleet of hundreds of large trucks that were, for example, supplying food to the major supermarket chains. You've got to pick up food at ports or airports, transport it to central warehouses, take it from the central warehouses and move it out to the individual stores. You've also got to do that safely, efficiently and quickly, often in vehicles that need to maintain a specific level of chilled or frozen refrigeration. Driver hours have to be monitored and managed, downtime has to be minimised. Trucks sometimes run 24-7 without the ability to charge at a depot overnight. And there are all sorts of regulations around maximum vehicle weights, which will be affected by needing to include huge heavy batteries as part of a new vehicle. So the freight and logistics sector has a huge number of challenges that private cars don't have. But let's look at some statistics here. For 2020, which is the last year complete stats were available, the UK logistics industry was worth £161 billion. Warehousing and support activities were worth £66.6 .6 billion and road freight, transport and removal services were worth £31.7 billion. In that same year, 144 billion million tonne kilometres were transported by road in the UK alone. Heavy goods vehicles, HGVs, is a term used to describe all lorries with a gross weight more than three and a half tonnes. Vehicle specifications vary by size and payload, but for most hauliers, the predominant HGV class is articulated, known as Artics, with a maximum gross weight of 40 tonnes. While transport is the UK's largest emitting sector of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 24% of total emissions in 2020, it's actually HGVs that carry a disproportionately large amount of that. Cars, for example, clocked up 244 billion miles and accounted for 6% of transport emissions, while HGVs clocked up just 17.4 billion miles, but were responsible for 19% of emissions. Over three times as much emissions with barely 10% of the miles driven. If the 400,000 HGVs on the UK roads today were switched to electric, the potential saving is 18.6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent the same as powering 2 million homes for a year. Now, I've said it before on this podcast and I'll say it again. Everything you have around you at the moment, all your furniture, your house's building materials, your food, clothes, those decorations you have on the sideboard, even the device you're listening to this podcast on, have all been transported at some point on the back of a lorry. The number of items in a modern first world environment that haven't been touched by road freight transportation is minuscule. And a lot of this is a result of the hub and spoke aspect of deliveries. If you've ever ordered a parcel and they've sent you a tracking link for it, you'll often see that your delivery starts at a factory or a shop. It gets shipped to some large central warehouse somewhere, then overnight to the nearest local depot, loaded onto a van or in some cases a cargo bike and delivered to your house. When I worked uh, deliveries for Morrison's during lockdown, I knew that all of their goods would have to transit through a single huge warehouse in Kent from where they'd be loaded onto a truck and shipped off to be delivered to individual stores. And at the moment, pretty much all of this is done by diesel trucks. Uh, time for a quick sidebar. I used to deliver Bombay Sapphire Gin to houses in Overton, Hampshire, from the Basingstoke Morrison site. Overton is the home of Bombay Sapphire Gin and their factory is located there. 
So a bottle of their gin would have to go from Overton to the nearest delivery logistics warehouse to the Central Morrison's warehouse in Kent, back to Basingstoke, to be stuck on the back of my van, which would deliver it to the house two miles from where it was originally bottled. And that's logistics for you. And for those of you thinking it would be cheaper just to walk to the distillery and buy it, hard luck. You can only access the shop after taking a paid tour, starting at £20. And whilst you can buy online, shipping is only included for baskets of £60 or higher. Now back to the show. The overall freight market is expected to have 2.5% growth between 2021 and 2026. Now, it's not a lot in percentage terms, but in terms of miles driven and greenhouse gas emissions, it's huge. So if we want to get rid of diesel and replace everything with zero emission vehicles, how do we do that? Well, it's not as easy as you might imagine. One issue we have at the moment is the batteries themselves. Now, I can drive my Volkswagen ID3 on a run in summer and get anything up to four and a half or even five miles per kilowatt hour efficiency on the run. But that's because it's a smallish, fairly streamlined car that doesn't weigh a great deal in the big scheme of things. It's certainly lighter than the two Volkswagen SUVs my neighbours have got. But if you then upscale that to the size of a 40-ton truck, complete with the trailer on the back full of your favourite Morrison's foodstuffs, the amount of energy needed to push that vehicle forward on its trip from the warehouse in Kent to a store in, say, Newcastle is quite large. In fact, it's measured in kilowatt hours per mile. Famously, Elon Musk's Tesla Semi, one of the first fully electric Arctics to be launched and which is currently in service with Frito-Lay Pepsi-Cola in the US, will need two kilowatt hours of energy to move a vehicle one mile along the road on average. My ID3 will do eight to 10 miles on that same two kilowatt hours of energy. However, data coming out from the US indicates that the Tesla semi trucks are performing as well as we expected. One in particular transporting cans from the Pepsi range drove 1500 miles over two days. The stats for this are available online and it appears that the vehicle stopped after 12 hours for a three hour charge, which tops it up to 100% from around 20% state of charge. It also did a couple of shorter stops to extend the range slightly. In a continuous run, it covered around 400 miles on a little over 80% of the battery. Now, given the huge payload it was carrying, that's not too shabby. What this does show, however, is that for any appreciable distance in an electric truck, you'll need huge batteries. If you've got a truck that does a specific route most days or has the ability to stop fairly regularly, you're going to be able to handle modest batteries with good charge speed. So what's out there at the moment? Well, the Mercedes-Benz e Actros 600 e-truck recently did a 600 mile journey through the Alps with a 40 ton load in a single day. That easily covers Kent to, say, Newcastle with range to spare. Engineers have designed the E-Actros 600 to deliver 1.2 million kilometres on the road over 10 years. Other manufacturers such as Volvo are also getting into the electric trucking business. So the rolling stock is getting there. The issue, as always, is the charging infrastructure. To manage the sort of charging needed to keep a fleet of E-Actros trucks on the road, you need lots of infrastructure designed to handle the specific needs of trucks. And this means long charging bays with side mounted chargers. This also means very fast charging. The standard is referred to as MCS, megawatt charging system. This means good, well-designed hubs that can handle lots of trucks, lots of drivers, and provide the facilities they need with charging at the speed they need. Now I've spoken to CPOs on this program and asked several of them about charging for trucks. None of them have a comprehensive solution for this, although both Osprey charging and grid serve charging can handle longer vehicles at several of their locations. But nobody has MCS charging at the moment. However, grid serve did announce recently that they were leading a consortium dedicated to designing and implementing what they're calling the electric freightway. Within the first two years of this seven year project, grid serve has committed to installing over 200 high power chargers across key motorway service areas and more than 10 commercial depot charging locations. 
Or within this, they'll also be deploying at least two one megawatt capacity high power chargers. This means that truck batteries don't need to be as big as some of those already designed because under EU laws, HGV drivers must stop every four and a half hours for 45 minutes. The hope is to better use that 45 minutes to recharge and get the driver on his or her way again with a full battery. Well, best of luck to that project. We'll keep an eye out on it. But let's talk about alternate fuels. Now, current diesel trucks can cover anything up to and even beyond 1,000 kilometres on a full tank of fuel, which means that we can do one of two things, assuming we don't want trucks charging every time a driver takes a break. We can wait until batteries have, have higher energy density and cover more miles on a given battery size, or we can investigate alternate fuels. And there are several of them at the time of writing. The bridging fuel that everyone likes to talk about is HVO. Now that stands for hydro-treated vegetable oil. Basically, it's chip fat mixed with some hydrogen and paraffin to create a drop-in replacement for diesel. Pretty much any engine that can run diesel can run HVO. It's no more expensive, it runs cleaner, and it kicks out fewer nasty things at the back end. But it is still a fossil fuel. It does still burn things. And while emissions are considerably reduced, they aren't zero. Now, I posted on the platform that used to be called Twitter recently that this is the equivalent of being run over in a stampede by a thousand smaller people rather than a hundred large people, or being bitten by lots of little venomous snakes rather than one huge venomous snake. It's probably less painful at the time, but the end result is the same. The next fuel that always raises its head when discussions such as this are opened is hydrogen. I was in a recent trade show in London and it was eye-opening the number of vehicles there that were pushing hydrogen as a solution. Again, as with HVO, Hydrogen has a lot of potential to be a great fuel for trucking and other logistics. It produces no emissions when processed through a fuel cell, it's fairly lightweight, it can be carried in bulk with large tanks, and it gives you excellent range. Well, it gives you range. But these are all the pluses that people use when trying to push hydrogen cars, and nobody looks at the downsides or the inherent dangers. Again, the issue here is that you need to have a good source of readily available hydrogen to make this happen. Advocates talk about electrolyzing hydrogen using excess renewables. But this is assuming that A, there's going to be excess renewables, and B, they'll be sufficient to enable widespread electrolysis of hydrogen after everything else has been accounted for. Even if both of these conditions are met, there are other far more important uses of hydrogen than moving cargo around the country. Uses which will have a more positive effect on the environment from a carbon dioxide and particulate point of view. For companies that produce hydrogen on site, and there are several of these, using it as a fuel for long-range trucks is okay as long as it's produced using electrolysis. For warehouses that have lots of solar panels on the roof, it might be possible for electrolysis to produce sufficient hydrogen to run a fleet of trucks. But for those that don't, this could mean using methane as a hydrogen source. And that's not great. In fact, that's distinctly bad. Relying on public hydrogen charging for trucks is also fraught with issues. Currently, there are, checks notes, eight public hydrogen refuelling stations in the UK. Two in Aberdeen, one in Edinburgh, Rotherham, Abergavenny, two in West London, and one in East London. This is down from 12 two years ago. It's not clear how many of these can A, accommodate large trucks, and B, provide enough hydrogen for large trucks on a large scale. Remember, these stations run out of fuel fairly regularly because there's more demand than they can cope with. And this is for fuel cell cars or fuel cell vehicles, which out of the 45.1 million vehicles registered in Great Britain at the end of Q3 2023, accounted for just 283 vehicles, a number comfortably exceeded by the number of cars running on natural gas, 57,939. So if you can't deal with hydrogen in sufficient quantities to run 283 vehicles, what chance do they have of producing enough hydrogen to run the 400,000 HEVs that need it? Which means 
that relying on public hydrogen infrastructure as it stands for trucks is probably a fool's game. What's not known, or at least figures are not readily available, is how many private hydrogen stations there are. What is known is that public stations cost about a million pounds per site to create hydrogen in situ. It's a pretty steep investment curve for many companies. Now, I was in a, a conversation with the guys from Renault Trucks at a recent trade event. I was sitting in a fully electric uh, skip delivery truck, completely the Yorkie bar in my hand, and I asked the guy from Renault, what was their strategy moving forward? They were basically very bullish about batteries, but they're not closing the door completely on hydrogen. From their point of view, if there is a business which has a specific case for a vehicle that can do extremely long distance with minimal fuel stops or relying on public charging, and the company is willing to suffer the increased capex and opex costs of producing hydrogen at their depot, then Renault are willing to provide a vehicle that will run on hydrogen. Now, I looked at the guy with a little bit of side eye and I said, there's probably not a whole load of companies with that particular business case, right? He smiled at me and changed the subject. The one big thing that we haven't dis discussed yet is cost. And this is fundamentally where business and private buyers will differ greatly. On a like for like basis, very few private buyers would pay double the cost of a car to get an electric version. If you can get a diesel Astra for X thousand pounds, nobody's going to pay two X thousand for the electric version, even if the overall cost of ownership is higher. But for fleet managers, this isn't always the case. Fleet managers will look at the overall cost of ownership for a truck. One reason is because the purchase price of things like trucks can be offset against either tax or depreciation in company accounts. This means that providing they can finance the actual cost within reason, it's not such a huge problem. Although if you look at the difference in cost between a diesel truck, say £200,000, an electric truck, £300,000, and a hydrogen truck, £500,000, at some point, this calculation starts to break down. But looking at something like an electric truck versus a diesel truck, the two main factors that will play into the costings are fuel costs and maintenance costs. Fuel costs will obviously be much lower for the electric version. Even if using public charging, the cost per mile on an electric truck will be considerably lower than for a diesel truck. The other key factor is maintenance. Keeping trucks roadworthy and working is a huge overhead for companies. Anything which means a truck is off the road, either for re uh, repairs or for planned maintenance, is costing the company money. So if an electric truck is going to be more reliable, which it is because there are fewer moving parts to go wrong, it will have a lower downtime and will thus cost less over the long run. Sidebar number two. I was talking to someone who runs a fleet of 25 electric vans. Over the last year, he has lost five days to maintenance for the 25 vans. Another branch of the same company running a similar number of diesel trucks has lost 85 days to maintenance. End of the second sidebar. Now, what this means is that within reason, the current higher purchase price of electric trucks is not as much of an issue as it would be for a member of the public buying an electric car versus a diesel car. Now, as with a lot of EV related issues, the main underlying cause of hesitancy is the same, lack of confidence. The lack of confidence is usually generated by people with vested interests in maintaining the status quo. It's quite easy to say, to say to someone, you can keep your diesel truck and get a thousand kilometers on the tank, or you can pay lots more for a battery truck where you'll only do a few hundred miles before you'll need to stop for hours and charge it. But as with most anti-EV propaganda, that tends to omit or ignore a few home truths that muddy the narrative. Incidentally, that's called paltering, and we'll talk about that in more detail in an episode next season. Nobody drives a thousand kilometers non-stop. The overall range of a truck on a single tank is completely irrelevant. It's like saying, I have something at home that stores 10,000 liters of drinking water, and I use it to make sure I can top up the five liters I drink every day. Why have a tank that stores 10,000 liters if you're only using five liters at a time? Get a tank that stores 100 litres. You'll have plenty for what you need. Secondly, all UK and most foreign truck drivers have mandated rest breaks every four hours or so. 
This allows adequate time for charging, as evidenced by both the Tesla Semi situation and the Mercedes E Actos run that we mentioned earlier. Of course, the fly in the ointment that makes this difficult at the moment, as mentioned earlier, is the actual infrastructure. If you're relying on the public infrastructure for your truck charging, especially in the UK and Europe, you'll probably not be able to run your truck as well as you might want to right now. If you've got local charging at a depot, this situation becomes more tenable. The GridServe Electric Freightway project will go some way to alleviating the issues with public charging for HGVs. But, as with everything related to the world of Electrify things, it will take time. There's always going to be someone wanting to push back against this. Either on a principle basis, I'm not going to go electric because someone says I have to, or an ideological basis, EVs are not the right solution, we'll wait for hydrogen, or a vested interest basis where people who stand to lose out from the electrification of trucking will protest. But that's the price of progress. When they stopped using whale oil to provide the oils for streetlights, the whaling industry disappeared almost overnight. The replacement was better, cheaper, and easy to get. Wouldn't surprise me if the same thing happens with trucks. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Stockholm is banning fossil fuel vehicles in the city centre. From early 2025, an area of 180,000 square metres, or about 20 blocks, that form the Swedish capital's finance and main shopping area will only allow electric cars, some hybrid trucks, and fuel cell vehicles. The measure comes on the back of moves to turn the capital into a walking city or a biking city along the lines of places like Utrecht and Amsterdam. To further reduce all car traffic, public transport is to be advanced while personal mobility in the city is to be improved for pedestrians and cyclists so that car trips are largely unnecessary. Heavy goods vehicles may also come as low emission hybrids when entering the new zones. Other exceptions include emergency and healthcare vehicles and drivers with a disabled parking permit. Love to see this. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got electric. Is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got Renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingTV with the words, Yorkies in hand. Hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know, I watched some of his initial videos where he was learning to ride the one wheel. On the face of it, the concept's easy. One foot either side, clasp the knees together and use your weight to steer, accelerate and stop. Now I asked him why it took him so long to learn, and he told me... It's never that simple, is it, Gary? Thanks for listening. Bye!